And now I'd like to present Stefan Swanepoel, a true real estate visionary and author with over 30 years of experience in the industry. Please give a big round of applause for our 2019 keynote speaker, Stefan Swanepoel. Let me look at the time so I can try and pace this roughly because I think we're behind schedule. Don't like being behind schedule. Good morning, everyone. Um, San Diego, most certainly a special city for me. When I immigrated to the States this year, exactly 25 years ago, this was the city I immigrated to. So I lived here for two years. So you most certainly have a very special place in my heart. Um, I was asked to give you a quick overview this morning. Now, 30 minutes is not a lot. Usually, I take about that amount of time just to warm up. I like to have longer time. The T3 Summer just took place the other day, and my first morning session was four and a half hours and I almost got through my material. Um, they asked me if I could quickly give you an overview of that summit, which I was reluctant to do because you weren't there. I can't condense three days into, into three or four slides, but I thought I would quickly just give you maybe two or three or four minutes. The T3 Summit, which was held here on Coronado Island on your, on, in your city, is a gathering of the most significant CEOs of the largest brokerage companies across the country. It's an invite-only event, so it's not intended for managers or agents. It's the CEOs, their own kind of a leadership event where they can get together and discuss. There's no vendors, no media. But the stage was impressive this year, and I thought I would give you one takeaway from each of the just one morning set of speakers which we had. Now, they had many pieces of wisdom, and they had lots to say. Again, I can't condense it for you, but here the opening keynote speaker or the opening person, the first person I interviewed was Rich Barton. Here's something to which he said, it's just not necessarily the most important thing he said, it's just one thing that I remembered from what he said. Data is the red blood cells of our business. So his whole point, his whole thrust of the talk was, please understand that the information which you have, which you as a company, as an agent, as a brokerage have, is super important. And we have not really given it the due value and attention in the last 20, 30 years that we should have. So we should not be surprised when other people try to use it, misuse it, guide it, implement it, aggregate it, felicitate it, sell it, IPO it, right? You didn't want to do anything with it for 20 years, so they did something with it. The next person was Ron Peltier, the Chief Executive Officer of Home Services. So you can see back to back from, from Zillow, first time the new CEO has spoken in his new capacity to a person which has been in the industry for 30 or 40 years. It's very difficult to invest in technology and stay in the black. Tech's expensive, and there's a lot. As Mary and I was talking a few minutes ago, it takes months to do, months to implement, months to train, months to roll out, and by the time you roll it out, you think, oh, well, I'm outdated, I have to get something new, and then the agents don't want to use it, then you have to buy another one, then you're not sure you got the right one. I mean, tech is hard. And it seems to be happening, if you read Inman, more and more, quicker and quicker, faster and faster. So we almost all of us feel that we're always one step behind. It's hard. So here is arguably one of the biggest company, well, the company that sold the most transactions last year as a single entity, but even he's saying it's hard and expensive. And he's got Warren Buffett in his pocket. <laughs> and he says it's expensive. So don't get frustrated when it's expensive. That was followed up by Robert Rifkin, right? Big new company, lots of funding. We saw the 1.2 billion funding that he's got, 4.4 billion dollar valuation, so very exciting. Discount brokerage is the real powerful competitor. He's the new guy. He's saying that even any kind of disruption or new competitive or open door, any kind of new model is disruptive, even for him. So change does not only affect the traditional and the old and the, and the state, it also impacts the new and the coming and the new business models. So Google is scared of the next thing. Facebook is scared of the next thing. Apple is scared of the next thing. So if you're scared of the next thing, the next thing is always going to be the next thing. There'll always be a next thing. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Deal with it. Right, deal with it. It's never going to go away. Don't, don't get upset against a discount brokerage or a Redfin or an EXP or a Compass. They are in the industry just like you were. At one stage, you were the new guy in town. Do you remember that everybody was upset with you? Now you're in town. Now you want to be upset with everybody else. Stop being upset with everybody. Put your head down and do your damn work. Right, focus. What is all this political crap we're busy with? There's enough business for all of us. This, this industry last year had $80 billion in commission. What percentage of that did you have? It's so damn small I can't measure it, so why are you upset about it? If you said I had 10%, I don't want to lose my 10%, right? We have big hitters. Ron Peltier said, I'm one of the biggest in the country and I couldn't even get to 4% national market share. Wow, so what we have is nothing. There's enough business for all of us. 
Um, the guy that followed up on that is the biggest con conglomerate of real estate companies, right? All the brands, those, the Century 21s and the Sotheby's and the Coal Bankers and the ERAs and the Climb Realty, oh, 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 oh. I mean, they have more brands than anybody else. He said, we're setting up incubation tanks. And what he meant by that is something that Richard, Sp Richard had said. He said, we're in permanent startup mode. If any of you brag to tell me that you're in the industry for 10 or 20 or 30 years, that's the worst thing you can do because you've become boring. You've become stale, you've become tired, you've become dormant, you've become the same old, same old. These guys, I mean, he owns some of the brands like Coal Banker. How old is Coal Banker? Like your age times two, right? I mean, it's an old company, 114 or something years old. What he is saying is, we're trying to be a startup. So a 114-year-old company is trying to be a startup. Isn't that cool? That is so cool. So if you're 10 or 20, 30 years, startup doesn't mean throw everything out the door. It means think new, different, progressive. Try and improve yourself. Most of you are doing things that you did five or 10 years ago. Ah. The NAR courses, which are great, which I've not been to most of them, the licensing exam, I mean, all of that stuff is, it is like so low down here benchmark. You guys should be here, you should be flying high. The fifth speaker in the morning, the fifth speaker in the morning is Gary Keller himself. There's only one train that really matters, tech. He says that's the underlying difference. Now, it doesn't matter whether he's referring to artificial intelligence or blockchain, or he's just referring you to be able to change the settings on your Facebook setting <laughs> or open your email. He's just saying, use tech better and more. He's not saying there's one silver bullet. He's not saying, go out to that one specific vendor, aisle three, second one from the top, the one with the popcorn and the peanuts, and go buy that tech. He's saying, go get, it, get any tech. Damn it, use it. Get good at it. Learn to, to improve on it. And it's continuous. Whatever you've learned today, that's good for today, <laughs> or this month or next month, and next year, year after that. You have to improve and change yourself so damn quickly because the newcomers, the new models, the guys which have the money, the guys which are half your age are learning and changing very quickly. There are many things about real estate which are exactly the same as they were in 1950. There are some things which are not even the same as it was last week. You've got to try and be smart enough to distinguish between which one. You can say the industry's never changed. You're right at half the times. Half the times you're wrong. You could say, well, it's important to know what Eamon said this morning. Half the time it's important, or the other time of the stuff, it's sensational. It doesn't matter. You better become smart enough to distinguish between sensation and fads and real things and not real things. The next speaker after that, the sixth speaker, Ben Sanford, EXP, the virtual company. Brokers and agents are addicted to bricks and mortar. I thought that was so cute. It's like Breaking Bad, right? The blue stuff. <laughs> We've fallen in love with ourselves. We love our own marketing. We love our own photos. We love our own post photos on our, on our visiting cars, right? We have become enamored with our logo, our company, our brand, our bricks, our motor, our office, our telephone, as if that's what it's about. We all know it was never about that. Where did, where did we get off the rails? Now, those are all tools that are still important. I'm not saying throw them out the door, the baby with the bathwater. I'm just saying it's not the most important thing. We made it the most important thing. We've allowed the tail to wag the dog. And it's us. It's us. You, all of you. That doesn't mean you shouldn't put your phone on your, on your, on your, on your postcard. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. I understand personal marketing. I get that. I'm saying just understand that there are so many other things that are more important than that. Still do that. Still promote yourself. But it's not just about you. Right? We're addicted to bricks and mortar. Now, of course, he's selling a virtual franchise, so I get why he's saying that. It's still a great sentence, because we are enamored about our offices sometimes, more than we should be. Right? You, you preach to a God, not to the, to the building of the church which you're in kind of stuff. Eye-buying is very real. Damn it! I mean, that is the eye-buyer guy! <laughs> but, but the Zillow guy said it. Gary Keller said it. Now, these are all the CEOs, and it, they were on stage. I questioned them, right? And if I question you on stage, you're not getting away from me. <laughs> If I got you, I got you. <laughs> but we're not trying to be sensational, so we weren't looking for scoops. We were trying to find out, seriously, you know, Saul, what keeps you up at night? Glenn, what keeps you up? You've got a discount brokerage. You've got one of the highest valuations at the moment in the stock market. You just announced new stuff on Inman this week. Your price is high. I mean, if anything's going well for somebody, it's going well at the moment for him. And he says, I buying is big, guys. Now, he doesn't say, and we asked, we asked Zillow, and we asked uh, Gary Keller, we asked Realogy, we asked Berkshire Hathaway, how big do we think the eye-buying market is? Nobody knows. But they seem to say somewhere between 5 to 20%, 5 to maybe 15%. 
Nobody thinks it's going to be 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. Nobody thinks it's taking over the market, but they're saying it's an interesting, innovative way to buy and sell real estate, which appeals to a certain percentage of the public, public in some of the cases. So you might say, well, they don't give me the best price. It doesn't work in my neighborhood. It doesn't work for expensive properties. Sure, that's the other 85 percent of the time. <laughs> it will still work somewhere sometime. So just be aware of it. There is not one brand or one company or one model or one type or one system that universally applies everywhere. I will show you, you can take any brand, I'm not picking any brand. I pick a big brand like a, a Century 21 or a Coal Banker or, or it doesn't matter who it is. And I will show you that brand which has an office which is not that great. And I will show you another office on that brand which is freaking awesome. It, it depends on the area, the manager, the CEO, the leader, the team leader, the agents, the group. <laughs> so when you see a bad office of a certain brand, doesn't mind what brand it is, don't look at that and say, well, they suck. And I, I, they, All offices like that are terrible. They're not. They're not. We have good ones of all types. So now if I start with my talk very quickly, the goal is to try and show you that whatever they said is just simply part of a cycle. Just like you grow up as a human being, just as a country goes through economic cycles, mortgages go through cycles, the stock market goes through cycles, our industry goes through continuous cycles. And not just from a mortgage pricing point of view, from a structural point of view, from a business model point of view, from an innovation point of view. If you speak to anybody who's been in the industry two or three or four or five decades, they will tell you, oh, can I tell you what happened in 1980, 1990? Now, on the one side, that's terribly boring because who the hell cares what happened in 1980? But it's also super interesting because we tend to do the same things over and over and over, maybe with different technology and different companies. But, but we have actually, from a technology point of view, a corporate point of view, a going public point of view, a postcards point of view, which was just given, we've done all of this. Nothing new. We, we tend to do it, and then it, it dies or fades away, gets acquired, gets absorbed somewhere. We go into something else, and then it tends to recycle back again. So we go through cycles, and it would seem that our industry, at this point in time, these cycles, Saul and John Riley and myself, we've been trying to look at them historically and say, how long do they last? Is there any reason to know that they're where, when do you see a start, when, when do you see an end? Is there any system which will tell you that there's a repetitive nature which is predictable? Or is it just like close your eyes and just pray to God, right? It would seem that it is somewhere in the one decade to two decade cycle. It seems to be a 12, 13, 14 year thing. Somebody comes up with an idea, whether it's eye buying or Remax or 100% concept or franchising or mergers and acquisition or technology or web, doesn't mind what it is. Somebody comes up with an idea. It takes a little while to get momentum. When it gets momentum, other people jump on the bandwagon. It goes mainstream. It gets market share. It becomes big. Inma talks about it. Everybody gets funding. It grows and it takes over the market. Everybody's scared. Everybody's paranoid. And then we go back to normal. <laughs> and then we wait a year or two. And then guess what? Somebody comes up with an idea. <laughs> Rinse and repeat. <laughs> and we go through this thing again. So when we go through the crazy part, People are making money and buying up companies and rolling up companies. And then we get to a stage where that concept, that idea, that business goes through a choice. Am I going to reinvent myself? Am I going to become a startup again? Am I going to be able to look at what I've done in the past and objectively and critically say, is this still applicable? Does it still work to the same level? And some of the stuff will work forever. And some of the stuff is yesterday's news. Most of the time, you guys cannot see it. You're too close, All right? When you go through a divorce, you're the last one to find out. <laughs> Why did that happen? Right? When the principal calls you and says, you know, your kids did this, you go like, but not my kid. <laughs> Everybody else's kid, not my kid. Sometimes you're so close to what's dear to you, important to you, that you miss it. But our industry, we believe, I believe, and I've written now 44 books on real estate, so I really believe that that research shows to me that we are somewhere in that purple zone. I can't tell you exactly where, but we are at a crossroad as an industry. We, we're struggling with, do we actually hold on to the old stuff, and that might pull us down like the Titanic, or are we going to try and maybe jump off the boat and save the boat, or don't we care, do we want to go down with the boat, or do we see another boat which we like more? We're not, we're not sure. So there is a shift, and every time there's a shift or a jump or a, I don't know, Rocky Horror Picture Show, right, a jump to the left, every time there's a jump or a move or a shift, there are consequences. Things happen. doesn't mind what, if you do things right or wrong, there's a shift. And according to me, the industry is full of cycles. So I can spend an entire day talking about each of these cycles. I have a 200-page book just on the slide. All I'm giving you is just a little piece of half of the third page of the quarter page at the bottom of the index. <laughs> 
You're just getting a piece, a teeny weeny piece. But what I'm giving you there is to, for you to understand that there have been cycles before our cycle. We are now at cycle number nine according to my calculation. It doesn't matter if it's nine or 10 or eight, who cares, but nine according to me. You can see roughly the years when that concept trend, business concept idea started, how long it roughly gained momentum. Then if you look at that yellow thing, the yellow lines and stuff, that's what basically was the driver during that time. That was the dominant activity. Start somewhere in the middle, let's say franchise, the franchise, cycle six in the middle. When franchises came to bear for the first time in 69, 70, 71, 72, prior to that there were no franchises. So 72, first major national franchise, C21, ERA, Red Carpet, Gallery of Homes, Realty World, Realty Executives, Remax. Ha! Got them all. Right? What happened? They all wanted to go national. That was their goal. What was the result of that? The word that you read after that is they became large, they built scale, they could leverage themselves, they could grow. Prior to 1972, there was not the same franchise or same business or same brand in San Diego and anywhere on the East Coast. The furthest the company in San Diego went was maybe Arizona. So they got scale. The next phase is when they got scale, what was the problem? They weren't talking to each other, they didn't have systems. So you'll see the next phase, what happened is they innovated and they physically automated each other. They got computers. They had to because they were not nationwide. Before they weren't nationwide, it didn't matter. Now they went nationwide. They were starting to go nationwide and they had all these local area networks and wide area networks and dial-ups and it was hard. So somebody said, damn it, why don't we create the internet? It's cool. <laughs> Let's do www.com, right? So the internet was born on the back of that. When we had the internet, we said it was cool, but now we could find with like things like Zillow and searching online and online and realtor.com, what we could do, we could now find new customers which we didn't have because before you were sending postcards just in your area, now I could put a flyer out to guys in Belize and China, anywhere. I could go find new customers and we opened up a whole new market of people. What happened when we opened up a whole new mind of people, customers, in cycle number eight? We suddenly found out that the, the consumers' minds were changing. They were now thinking that they were smarter than you because they could surf, they could zestimate, they could look for things. They could sit 12 o'clock at night and type in house price value, right? As if you can get the right answer on Google and as if you can get it in five seconds, as if you can ever find out anything which is truthful. But that's not the point. They thought they became smarter. So we had a consumer that were changing mindset and we found out that the consumer wanted different experience because we were offering them an experience which was roughly a hundred freaking years old. The next phase, which started about six, seven, eight, nine years ago, the consumer said, if I'm changing my mindset, I want you to service me in a different way. I want you to give me a different experience. That experience which your grandpa gave to my grandpa, don't cut it anymore. They went on horses together to school. We're not doing horses now. <laughs> right? It changed. I'm using the extremes, of course, but it's just to prove the point. We don't drive the cars which were made in 1950. They're antiques or classics, right? We buy them on an auction, we put them in a garage, clean them with a toothbrush. <laughs> We don't drive them anymore. So why are you driving an, an, an MLS that is 50 years old? Or an association that's 50 years old? Or a franchise that's 50 years old? Or a listing system that's 50 years old? Or a, a form that is 50 years old? But we got stuck in it. So the industry is now saying, I want new models. They don't know what it means. Now they don't really care whether you're Redfin or EXP or Berkshire either way. That's not the point. But they're saying, I want a different experience. Who can give them the different experience? Anybody. Who said Compass had exclusively on a new experience? Ha! When franchising came out, there wasn't one company that had exclusivity. When it was 100% concept, Remax didn't own that model. When Berkshire Hathaway or HFS bought other companies, are they the only companies that can buy companies? No. When a new model comes, it starts from somebody who generally doesn't do it because the traditional person is stuck in their old paradigm. So a newcomer comes and does it, and then we, the old traditional paradigm, we look at that, we go like, you're a disruptor. How dare you? You're doing something different. Well, damn it, you should have done something different. But we were stuck. You, we usually are. So the new guy does something, and then we think it's a disruptor. Standing this side of the fence, we call this innovation. <laughs> it's, it's cool, it's sexy. Standing over here, you're terrible, you're a bad person. I'm good. The guy standing here says, you're so old school. You're traditional. You look like your grandfather. You haven't changed in 50 years. No, I know what's going on. I've got all this experience. In 1962, we did it this way. It still works. 
I love my office. No, you should go virtual. I, I don't know, I'm kidding, right? I'm just fooling with you. But it's that different. So when the new guys want to start something, they went to outside people. Why? Because it's the time of the day of the year of the flavor of the Ubers and the Airbnbs and the Netflixes and the Netscapes and the Yahoos and the Amazons. Who cares? The outside world is looking for an opportunity. If I told you, give me whatever money you have and I will tenfold double increase it for you, guaranteed, <laughs> or high probability, how would you like a million bucks? I could get you shares in Uber now with hindsight at the prices which it was 12 years ago. Are you interested? They cost a penny apiece. They went public today at $85. We'd like to wear a penny piece. People want to take chances on innovation. So these new guys are getting money. There's nothing wrong with that. Any of you guys here in the traditional box, if I came to you and said to you, here's $500,000 for you to grow your business, would you categorically deny me giving you the money? Would you say to me, I don't want new money. I don't want to grow. I like my old paradigm self. I don't want to change it. I don't want to get a computer. You wouldn't do that. So why are we belittling these guys that are getting the new money? Now, do the new people know everything? Hell no. You guys still have the experience. You still have the knowledge. This is still a new paradigm company. It's a relatively new company. But they're trying. What are they trying to do? The same as you. They're trying to make a good living. They're trying to grow a business. That you're just slightly agitated at them because they have more money than you do. I would be the same way. I hate it when my wife has more money than I do, right? It's not a nice feeling. You want to be the guy with the most money. So when somebody else has more money, it's tough. So capital is changing our frustration level. And I get it because if you look at the number of money which is poured in, so look 2015, that's $930 million that was invested from outside into what we would generally call a tech startup. I mean, do any of you know how much, is? that's almost a billion. Do you know how much a billion is? Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> Thousand is three zeros, a million is six zeros, a billion is nine zeros. That sounds like an international dialing code, <laughs> right? I want to call Argentina, right, Z nine zeros. I mean, it's a big ass number. <laughs> then look at 2016, it like almost doubled to 1.6 billion. Then the year after, look where the hell, it was, where's it going now? Rilogy last yesterday went under a billion dollars. The market cap for the whole Realogy, which has got seven brands and NRT, it's the single biggest brokerage in the country. It has more brands than anybody else. It has three of the top five brands in the world. That's only worth a billion. 5.8 billion was poured into new businesses in 12 months. That's like the same guy winning the lot of four times in a week. You might, it's not right, but it happened. Cool. Then the next year, you could say, oh, oh, well, it went down, it turned. Guys, you think there's a difference between <laughs> 5 billion and 5.8 billion? From our point of view, both of them are a hell of a lot of money. They're not even close. This year, we're only at Q1, but if you take the, the amount of money which was put into Q1 and you extrapolate over the, ne of the rest of the year and you allow December to be zero, <laughs> we're probably going to end at about 5.4 billion. 5.4 billion? That is more than the market cap of most likely Realogy, Keller Williams, Remax, Howard, Howard Hanna, Lennox Scott, Baird and Warner, Long and Foster, Weikert's combined. And that's just the investment in 12 months. So the amount of money coming in has most certainly changed the rules. I'm giving you three examples here. Now, as you can tell, I'm a fairly outspoken person. I'm fairly direct. So don't see any of these as promotions. I don't, I don't knock a company, but I don't promote a company, but I'll give it to you straight. It's just my nature, right? A spade is spade. A spade is black, right? So Compass bought some companies, and they have now the third largest brokerage in the country. That's impressive if you think that there's 86,000 companies. Now, whether they're third or fourth, I believe they're third, but it doesn't matter. Three, four. They are one of the biggest companies. They are only behind Realogy, and they are only behind NRT. They're only six years old. Religion with all its pieces below it is like hundreds of years old. It no longer requires you to become 100 years old to hit a home run. As a matter of fact, it could be an advantage to be younger than that. Redfin 
the, the, top, the top guys did the acquisition strategy part, right? They bought agents, they bought companies. The top company, or the next company, Redfin, didn't buy any real estate companies and didn't buy agents. They basically created cool tech. They went on the Gary Keller route. They said, we're going to buy cool tech and we're going to create a new model. With its discount or iBrokers, they came up with a, a variation. You might say, well, it's not completely unique. Who cares if it's not completely unique? It's pre predominantly different and more than the traditional model. They are now the top, one of the top five brokerages in the nation. EXP recruits a bucket load of agents, something like 17,000 in a period of approximately two to three years, and they become a top 10 brokerage. Why I'm putting up that slide is to show you that new players, which have either gone public or raised money or got money or put, people put money in or they did an IPO, used different strategies. That's the important part. There is no single strategy that makes you a winner. There are many ways to become winners. And not one of those strategies is wrong. If you talk to Stephen Gain, he says to you, I'm recruiting all day long. Right? So Sotheby's recruits all day long. Building tech. Do we know other companies but Redfin that are building tech? There are hundreds of companies using tech. Mary was telling me some of her tech. Berkshire Hathaway, they build tech. Compass buys Pack Union. Berkshire Hathaway bought Long and Foster. So none of those strategies are new. They're just doing it because you're doing nothing or a large number of you are doing nothing. If you stand still, the new guys are gonna come you by. The only way to compete is stand up and be counted and compete. And you can do all of that. There's nothing, there's nothing you can't do. There's nothing you can't do. The interesting part, however, is that many of the new companies tend to do it faster. Our industry is, I mean, I absolutely, I've been in the industry now 36 years. So I am as much you as, as you are. I'm even more you than you are. So this industry is super cool. I love you to pieces, but damn, you can frustrate the hell out of me. We, we are like hurting cats sometimes, right? We don't want to change as a group. Individually, we're, we're gregarious and charismatic and outgoing and lovable and all the cool stuff. Together as a room, you're stubborn. We don't want to work together and we argue in an association, we argue about MLSs, we argue about the common, the constitution and articles and membership and three-way agreement. Meanwhile, the new guys, they keep their eye on the ball and they move relatively fast. The speed of which change has happened in recent times is just surprisingly fast. I thought I'd give you two examples just for you to understand the picture. The first one is outside our industry, the next one's in our industry. Here's one technology which we all understand and know. The telephone from the day it was invented approximately to approximately the time you'll see at the bottom it says reached 50 million users. Now, 50 million is not a magical number. It's just a line in the sand. I could have picked any number. I just thought 50 million users of a product clearly says <laughs> this product has made it, right? I mean, it's pretty widely accepted. So the telephone took 75 years old or 75 years of time. 75 is reasonably close to the age which we, most of us are going to get. I mean, that, it sounds like a lifetime age. I understand that maybe we'll get 80 or 85 or 90 if we're very fortunate, but that is a lifetime kind of an age. So that means that somebody could be born and the telephone wasn't there and the telephone reached 50 million user maturity by the end of his entire life. The next one, TV, television, took only roughly the time that most of us were at school. I know most of you are 12, I was like 13, I spent an extra year. No, but I mean, it takes about 12 years, which means you started school and that product did not exist. And by the time you graduated high school, that product had also 50 million users. So can you see it's no longer lifetime, it's now school lifetime. It's significantly faster. Look at the next one, internet. Oh, that only took the time which you went to one school, either middle school or elementary school or high school. So even faster, which means again, you went to grade seven, no internet by the time you were graduating high school, internet was in the classroom. It changed even school. Now I know the next one's not, not a big product, but it was interesting that Angry, Angry Birds <laughs> only took 35 days. And I know it's not comparable to the telephone, but the amusing part is that one technology is built on the other one is built on the other one. So when new companies come, whether it is EXP or Compass or Redfin, or it is you wanting to redesign and develop yourself, don't give me that crap that you need five years or 10 years to create a plan. Don't create a plan of 20 pages. Don't send it to committees to think about and to debate. You have gotta get your act together and you have to move at the telephone, you had a lifetime to take a decision. On the television or the internet, you had roughly 48 months. These days, products are coming out so quickly, by the time you're still thinking about it, somebody else has already done it, implemented, got the market share, grabbed the beachhead. That's what's frustrating most of us. It's too fast. It's not that you're scared. 
It's not that you can't handle it. It's just you've got other real stuff to do, right? You've got to sell hope, you've got to sell real estate. You've got an open house this afternoon, you've got a contract. You have to leave my talk to go and close something. You have to docusign something. And in that time which you take to go and docusign something, I'm gonna start a new company, buy six other companies, IPO it and become a billionaire, and you just did one sale. <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> No, I mean, exaggeration, of course it's exaggeration. It, it proves the point. Now you could say, does that apply to real estate? I believe it does. I took 10 billion again just as a placeholder. Not important, but 10 billion. Very, very few companies get to 10 billion in annual sales. That's a big number. So I looked at the previous century and I said, did any companies get there? And there were not many, but there was a, a few handfuls. I put some names up there, random names, Howard Hanna, Douglas Elliman, Wyckers, Long and Foster. And the average company, and those are all, each one of those companies, if I use them as examples, they are mega, major, cool, awesome. They did everything right, or the majority of things right. These are not failures, these are A plus students. It took most of them 40, 50, 60 years, which is roughly back to that 75 number, right? It's like a lifetime. Which means, let's take the top one. Jim Weikert, or the next one, um, Wesley Foster, started a business and at his 20s or 30s, and it took him his entire life, up to 70 or 80, to get to 10 billion. Look at the guys which started in the last century. I just mentioned a few. Redfin Compass, EXP, Realty One. They all did it in five to 15 years. That's like that school example. They're not taking a lifetime. They're saying, I'm gonna do five of these in a lifetime. I'm gonna do it repetitively. So our own industry is already an example that you can do everything you did before faster, and if you don't, somebody new is going to do it faster than you. So we like to use the word gradually and then suddenly. Everything has actually been happening over time because I gave you the cycles. It's in a book. I put it in a book. Shame on you if you didn't read it. I told you about this 10 years ago. Right? It's been happening not because I'm smart, because you can actually see how the shifts gradually occur. The tree was planted 10 years ago. Now when you walk in and say, well, the tree's all grown up. Yeah, well, I planted it 10 years ago. What do you think? It's going to not grow? Of course it's going to grow. Don't be surprised. Trees grow when you plant them and you put, give them water. Flowers flower. Real estate companies put billions into them, they grow. That's what happens. Why are we surprised that EXP is a success? Why are we surprised that Compass is a success? But why are we surprised that Berkshire Hathaway is a success? If you're committed, if you have management, if you have leadership, if you have talent, of course it will grow. You all have the ability to do that. So whether we have turmoil or disintermediation, change or disruption or technology innovation, we are going to have tons of that. It's going to be total overload. You're not going to be, handle it, be able to handle it unless you want to. If you don't want to handle it, recommend you don't read Inman anymore. Don't read the news. If you want to handle it, you're interested, sure, read the news, but then the step is after you've read it, what are you going to do next? What's the next step? Don't read about it and then bitch about it. Read about it and say, how does it impact my business, my company, my market, my zip code, my market, whatever it is. And what am I going to do about that? You don't have to have to have a plan for anything or everything, but the success is going to be how you respond. In closing quickly, here is two examples which are not easy to relate to because they're outsiders. This guy is the CEO of Palm. Look at the year 2006. This is his quote. We've learned and struggled for years to figure out how to make a decent phone. No outside guy, no PC guy like an Apple guy is going to come around and just figure and walk this in, right? Doesn't that sound like us? Well, I've been in Rancho Bernardo now for 32 years. I know the market very, very well. And Rancho Bernardo people won't like Compass. They don't do virtual, they don't do EXP, and they won't like iBuyer from Redfin. And they absolutely will not associate with anything that is an iBuyer concept from Open Door. They only love me because I'm the soccer mom. <laughs> really? That doesn't mean that you're not cool if you're the soccer mom. It means it might not be enough in the future. So look what happened to this guy. At the time which he said it in 2006, he had a $53 billion market cap. Now remember, Religi's only $1 billion. Redfin's only $1.8 billion. Remax is only, I think, about one point, or under one at the moment. So Remax, Remax and Religi are only worth $2 billion. This guy had $53 billion. He screwed it up in four years. He lost all of it. It was defunct. How many of you still use a Palm Pilot? How many of you even remember a Palm Island, right? <laughs> like, now you're dating yourself. It's like, woo -hoo. All back to the stuff. Look at this guy, Blockbuster. Neither Redbox or Netflix are even on the radar as my competition. What are you, an idiot? You didn't see that one coming? Now, these big companies don't hire idiots. They hire smart people. These guys get like seven-figure salaries. They're cool. They're smart. 2008, he said, I didn't see it. 2004, he had 9,000 stores. He's now down to one. 
There's one blockbuster left, which they've kept open exclusively for the privilege of being able to say, I'm the last one. <laughs> you can now go for a selfie to a blockbuster store. All right, last one in the world. That's the only reason they stay open. They don't even have clients anymore, but you can go to selfies. But, I mean, so in, in what? Roughly 15 years, he killed 9,000 stores. What would happen if real estate, if we killed 9,000 real estate companies? Now, we're not a commodity like a Netflix. We're not exactly the same. But that doesn't mean that there isn't some similarity which we can learn from it. Here is a list of some companies which I thought you remember. Here are some of the ones which I think, personally think, responded a bit too slowly. Now, clearly, I'm not going to say that any of our companies are responding slowly. That's for you to decide. I'm not here to judge. But here are some nice outside examples that you could say, well, Sears or Kodak or whatever, they missed the boat. But it doesn't mean that old companies can't make it. Here's the next slide. These are old paradigm companies that did not respond slowly. They responded timely. They hit it out of the park. They, they actually grew as a result of the disruption. They actually liked it. So you can't say old is bad and new is good. You can't say that. It's false. But neither can you say the opposite. You can't say old is bad either, or new is bad and old is good. That doesn't apply either. Old is okay if old is willing to change and adapt and grow. New can be good as well and can be okay if you're willing to understand and respect and change and grow. It's the attitude which you have and the growth which you have. There most certainly will be many companies in the existing paradigm that will succeed. Many. But I wouldn't be surprised if half of, half of the industry is gone in five or ten years. I, that would not be a surprise. All of the new companies are not going to succeed, but many will. Many will. And they will be sitting in your chairs in years to come. So it is all at the end of the day how you respond. So the last slide I'm going to give you as a takeaway, my quick four points to try and summarize. Please be open-minded. Don't critique your competitors. Don't say bad things. Don't hate them. There's room for place for all of us. Just understand, as we are people diverse, as we are companies diverse, we are model diverse. And that's fine. They are trying to do what you're trying to do. You might say, well, they don't offer full service at that price. No, you mean you're not willing to offer full service at that price. Doesn't mean they can't. How do you know they can't? Right? They're going to try. I'm sure they'll make mistakes. Next one, find a market. Steve Games is a good example, right? Find a market, whether it's a brand, a town, a city, a product, a market, luxury, top end, high end, doesn't matter what it is. Find a market which you define as yours and own it. Just, I mean, own it, right? Just conquer it. There's enough zip codes, enough segments, seniors, luxury, military, retired, doesn't matter what it is. Pick that spot and, and take, take the high ground. Take it and own it. It'll be easier to dominate. Continuously, ongoing, never ending, Try and make yourself as an individual, as a team, as a manager, as an office, as a branch, as a company, better. Don't ever let me come to your company to find out that you're doing the same, you know what, that you did last year. You've got to always do something better. Now, don't try and do 20 or 30 or 40 things at the same time. You can't handle it like Jack Nicholson said in A Few Good Men, right? We, we simply can't. As human beings, we have too much time stuff to do. We all have families, we have to make money, we have to put a bread on the table, we have a normal life, a regular life. You can only do one or two or three things at a time. So when you want to innovate on yourself, pick one thing and master that and do it well for 6, 12, 18, doesn't mind how long it takes. There's no, there's no bad recipe. And once you've mastered it, you said, I've got this, then you can take the next one on. Don't try and do 20 stuff because you'll screw 19 up probably. I do. We all do. It's just, it's too hot. I've got other stuff to do. I've been married for 40 years. If I don't come home at a certain time, I'm in deep doo-doo. Right? I've got to go home to a certain time. And I work hard, but I've got to go home. The dog or the cat loves me too. Right? Number four, and when we play, you don't have to beat a competitor. You don't have to break a competitor. You simply just have to win. And we can all win. Doesn't mind who's number one in a zip code. Doesn't mind which real estate company is the biggest. Who cares if Berkshire Hathaway has more money than Compass? You're not in that competition. <laughs> It's, it's not about that. It's interesting. We read about it. We research about it. We get the stats. We talk about it. But it's not what it is. All you simply have to do is when you play, you play to win. Whatever niche you've identified because you have an open mindset to change, because you're innovative and you're cool. How can you not win? Of course you're going to win. Right? This is super easy stuff. If I went too fast for you and you feel that you'd like to get a refresh, <laughs> I quickly put everything for you at that place. You can just text that number to that place, and you can get a 20-page summary of what I just now said, and of all of the models which I've tried to analyze for you side by side. 
not selling it. It's just a free PDF download that you can get. This is super easy, right? All right, welcome to reality. We're going to break. I think somebody else is coming up on stage, if I remember. I don't remember who. And then we're going to bring a panel back. And then we're going to ask each of those panel people what they think about the future and what are they doing to prepare. So you can hear from actual brokers and tech visionaries what they're going to do. Thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm.